When I was your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You've been so, so kind to me. And oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God, His love is pursuing you, no matter where you are in life, no matter where you are in your faith. He wants to chase you down and seek you out wherever you are. The relentless love of God says, I will stop at nothing to have your heart. There's something that happens when we shift our awareness from all the fear, from all of the lies, from that unloved place. We fix our attention on the one who walks on water, the one who calls us his beloved. This is the truth that sets us free tonight, the love of God, the love that is greater than guilt, stronger than shame, more powerful than fear. I want you guys to position yourself inside his love tonight, from the top of your toes to the top of your head, that you would feel the love take hold of you, deeper than anything else that has a hold of you. There's no shadow. There's no shadow in this room tonight. No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up. Come. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, come and ask. Me sing it out. There's no shadow you won't light up. Mountain you won't climb up. Come and ask me. There's no wall you won't kick down. Lie you won't tear down. Come and ask me. There's no shadow you won't light up. Mountain you won't climb up. Come and ask me. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Oh, the overwhelming. 
thank you for your love, Jesus. We cannot do this alone. I can't do this alone. You chased me, and you chased me, and I ran. And you pursued, and you continued to call me your own. There's nothing that we can do or say to make you fall more in love with us. You fully love us now, God. You keep coming around with the everlasting love. Though we have failed a thousand times, you pick us up every time. You pick me up every single time. I also pray for anyone in this room that doesn't feel your love right now or at all. And I pray that you would wrap your arms around them, remind them how loved they are. I pray that you would touch hearts tonight to speak to Lindsay. Amen. you guys. Okay, okay, it took you a minute. So um, I'm not Tony. Um, <laughs> my name is Lindsay, for those of you who don't know me. So I am one of the middle school girls leaders. Where are my girls at? That was lame. Where are my girls? <laughs> switching it up tonight. So, yeah, I'll this is the way to my heart. So, yeah, that's all about me. Um, so, we're going to start off our conversation today with the question. There it is. Okay. What would you do if you knew you would never get caught and there would be no consequences? That's a loaded question. So think about it, keep it to yourself. What would you do if you knew that you couldn't get caught and that there would be no consequences? For me, I would totally go to that five seconds of summer concert that my parents told me I couldn't go to. I mean, if I couldn't get caught, I would totally go. Um, so some of us probably had some pretty dark, twisted thoughts. We all have these dark thoughts, but we've gotten so good at hiding it and not letting anybody know that they're there. So to share a little bit about my story, I gave you a couple facts about myself, but a little bit about my story. Um, I struggled with a lot of guilt and shame when I was going through high school. So I went down a really bad path and that came with a lot of guilt. So I'll share a little bit more about my story in a minute. So we're going to talk about King Solomon for a minute. In Proverbs, he writes, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Everything you do flows from your heart. So we can continue to monitor ourselves. We can continue to put this filter on, put this mask on, but that doesn't really solve the problem. The problem is what's in our hearts. Have you ever heard the term garbage in, garbage out? I'm pretty sure I've said it to my girls multiple times already. When <laughs> so when you put this garbage into yourself, when you're 
watching movies and TV shows that you shouldn't be, listening to music that's maybe questionable, hanging out with a certain group of people, you're putting all of these negative things into your life. And ultimately, that's what's going to reflect in your actions and in your thoughts. That's what shows that what comes from your heart is what you, what is coming out of you. So that leads us to the big word for tonight, guilt. I'm sure all of us in this room have felt guilty about something in the past. I for sure have. So guilt, by definition, is the feeling of responsibility or remorse for some offense, crime, or wrongdoing. We have two different types of guilt. So our first type is false guilt. False guilt is when you feel bad, you feel guilty about something that you didn't do or that's out of your control. Do not let yourself feel guilty if it is out of your control. I'm going to repeat that. Do not feel guilty if it's something that's out of your control. If it is something that you didn't do that has nothing to do with you, you don't have to feel guilty. That is Satan trying to attack you. Then we move on to actual guilt. So guilt a lot of times is confused with shame. We're going to unpack that in a minute. But we don't want to confuse guilt and shame because that can lead to self-destruction. So the next couple slides, I have some examples of things that maybe you've done, maybe you feel guilty for. Maybe you copied a little bit too much of your friend's homework. I've been there. <laughs> Don't do it. Just do your homework, please. Maybe you didn't tell your girlfriend the whole story of what happened at the party. Or maybe you lingered a little too long on that website that you knew you shouldn't have been on. Maybe you told your stepmom you were going one place, and you did, but there was a different crowd than you told her would be there. Or maybe you just didn't tell your parents at all. And last one, maybe you said you were studying the whole time, but really you were binging that new show with your textbook open. How many of us have been here? I can confidently say I have been here. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so I've been in a lot of these situations. They have led to this guilty feeling. We, we got, we've gotten really good at justifying our sins and making light of something that's a big deal. So some excuses that we tend to make up just as people, as teenagers, I'm still a teenager myself, <laughs> I wasn't the only one. Okay, well, I wasn't the only one that went to the party, or I wasn't the only one that lied to my parents. This is not a valid excuse. The next one, <laughs> I was going through a bad phase. I made this excuse a lot. So a big part of my story has to do with substance abuse. I went through a really rough time that involved alcohol. I found something that I could numb the pain with, and that ultimately led to me being the furthest from God that I have ever been. And I got really good at hiding it. So I turned to all of these worldly things when in reality I had a savior that I could have turned to. So I justified everything that I was doing, all of the bad decisions that I knew I was making that I knew were wrong 
with I was going through a bad phase. Now, while that was true, that doesn't make it okay. Because God hates sin. I became so addicted to this lifestyle. It was this lifestyle of doing something bad, doing something that I knew I wasn't supposed to be doing. And I was addicted because I found something that could numb the pain. All that really deep hurt that I was feeling. Again, God hates sin. He hates seeing his kids doing things that they know they shouldn't be doing. Once I found Jesus, there are no words. Like once I found Jesus, there was, I, I felt him. I felt redeemed by him. But I felt these huge amounts of guilt with knowing that he was there through that season of my life, knowing that I could have turned to him instead of all of these secular things. And so that led to a lot of guilt, a lot of guilt with knowing that I was wrong and knowing that I had hurt people. And that was never my intention. But in hurting myself, I hurt others along the way. Fortunately for me, I have a redemptive story. I have a story where I can share the light of Jesus with people. Not everybody has that story. Not everybody comes out of a season like that still standing on their feet. But because of Jesus, I was able to come out of that season. I was able to come away from that. So another excuse that we really like to use, it's not my fault. If you intentionally made a wrong decision, that is on you. It is 100% your fault. But here's where we get guilt and shame confused. So guilt is knowing that what I did was wrong. Shame is the feeling that I am wrong. Like there is literally something wrong with me. Like God messed up when he made me. Let me tell you something. Those are lies straight from the pit of hell. I know that there are some of you in this room that have gone through some really horrible things that nobody should ever have to go through. And just know that those things are not your fault. That is something that's out of your control. That is something that you should not feel guilty about. That is not something that you should feel shameful about. Satan likes to tell us these lies. He feeds us these things to make us question our faith. So if you're one of those people that has gone through something, and there are probably a lot more that I don't even know about, but if you're one of those people that has gone through something, know that it's not your fault. But if you intentionally made a wrong decision, that is on you. The things that I did were intentionally, it, intentionally wrong. I knew that what I was doing was going against what my parents say, what my faith says, what the law says, and I did it anyway. So that is my fault. I use this excuse a lot. It's not my fault. 
but it totally is. So I'm owning up to it. I am forgiven by my Savior. But have you forgiven yourself? So we're going to talk about Paul for a minute. So Paul wrote Romans. And before he was the Apostle Paul, he was Saul of Tarsus. Saul went around, not, not just ordering people to kill others, but he actually killed people. Like, he went around killing people for believing in a God that he later on in his life decided to believe in. So if anyone were to feel guilty, it would have been Paul. So in Romans chapter 8, he writes, Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the power of sin and death. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Our sins are forgiven when we accept Jesus into our lives. Now, we have no liberty to do what we want, but once we give those things up to Jesus, we no longer have to feel guilty about them. When you accept Jesus into your life, you no longer have to feel guilty. So, moving on, next verse. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. You know that verse that we all learn, John three sixteen. It's like, the first verse you learn in Bible in little Sunday school. This is it. It's saying the same thing. God sent his son in likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. So, because of Jesus, guilt doesn't have to be the boss of you. And if you've accepted Jesus into your life, I would even go as far as saying, because of Jesus, guilt isn't the boss of you. When you accept Jesus, I can't say it enough, when you accept Jesus into your life, your sins are forgiven. You don't feel guilty anymore. Okay, so I'm going to go off on a little tangent for a minute. Guilt isn't always necessarily this super negative thing. Guilt can sometimes be the Holy Spirit convicting you, convicting you to do the right thing. When you've wronged someone, when you've done something that you knew was wrong. The Holy Spirit convicts us to do the right thing, to own up to it, to apologize to that person. So it has this negative connotation, but it's not always necessarily a bad thing. We do have to learn how to let it go. Tangent over. So, although we have no condemnation for our sins, like what Paul wrote in Romans, we so often try to justify our actions. We think that we're right, and we argue. By a show of hands, how many of us in this room have gotten into an argument with a sibling when you know you're wrong, but you argue anyway? Actually, not me. I'm always right. <laughs> Yeah, no, I've been there. You know you're wrong, but you argue just for the sake of arguing. I'm pretty sure we've all been there. Sorry, only children. <laughs> so, to illustrate 
to illustrate this point, I need you guys to participate. What do I need you to do? Wow, that was awesome. Amazing. So, for those of you that have seen Sean McDowell's Atheist Glasses uh, sermon, this is the same idea. When I put these glasses on, I no longer have any idea of anything that I just said. So no matter what I say, I need you guys to keep talking to me, okay? So I'm going to put a slide up. It's my next slide. And I need you to tell me what's wrong with it. I take that back. This is the next slide. So the next slide <laughs> has something wrong with it. And I need you to tell me what it is. Not the Bible verse. <laughs> Again, no matter what I say, I need you to tell me what's wrong with it. So when I put these glasses on, I no longer know anything that I just said. Yeah? Okay. All right. Okay. When you're right, no one remembers. But when you're wrong, everyone remembers. So I think that my sentence is perfect. But I don't, I don't know what you're talking about, though. But I think I'm correct. <laughs> but I think that my way is the right way. Because this is the way that I wanted to write it. <laughs> okay, but... Nobody cares, you're wrong. But this is the way that I wanted it. And Will, I don't really care what you think. I spelled it the way that I wanted to. I spelled it the way that I wanted to. My love, we know you're dyslexic. You got to get this together, girlfriend. <laughs> okay, well, maybe, may, okay, maybe I was wrong. Does that help? Well, now you can't see the word that's wrong. Okay, well, now I feel bad because you guys convinced me that I was wrong, and I tried to justify that. But in reality, this is the incorrect way to spell right. <laughs> Thank you for participating. That was good. So I went through a couple different phases when I was trying to prove to you that this was correct. I do know that this is incorrect. Just going to throw that out there. So we, oh, it didn't go. We have these steps 
in arriving at this guilty feeling. We pretend we don't see it. I stood here, I said to Leland, I don't know what you're talking about. I like, yeah, <laughs> we agree, or we argue that it's right. So I stood here and I was just like, I think that my way is right. I really had no proof. We decide we don't care and we do what we want. That was me saying to Will, well, I don't really care what you think. And then we agree that it's wrong. I said, okay, maybe I am wrong. But we try to cover it up. I got really, really good at covering things up. This is, this is a big one. We've gotten really good at putting on a mask, putting on this front to cover things up. And then we feel guilt with knowing that what we did was wrong. So then I said, and now I feel bad because I know I'm wrong. I'm admitting that I'm wrong. So we went through all of these steps. I went through all of these in trying to argue that my point was right. But in reality, I was in the wrong. So I have a couple practical steps for living fully for Jesus and letting him take that guilty feeling away from you. So our first one. You are no longer allowed to condemn yourself or punish yourself. That is not your job. You cannot punish yourself. You have to forgive yourself. You don't get to condemn others for their mistakes. That is not your job either. That is God's job. He is the judge. So you can call a brother or sister out in love, but you do not get to condemn them for their mistakes. This one gets me. Your guilt will remind you, but it won't define you. I'm going to say it again. Your guilt will remind you, but it won't define you. Satan is going to constantly try to remind you of all of the things that you did. All of those bad choices that you made. He's going to constantly remind you of that dark place that you were in. And he's going to try to bring you back to that place. But God takes that from us. That's not what God says of us. God says, you are fearfully and wonderfully made in my image. You are not defined by what the world says of you. You are defined by what God says of you. So your guilt is going to constantly remind you. You're going to always be reminded of all of these guilty feelings but it does not define who you are. And our last one. You are free to make things right with the person that you hurt without expectations of getting something back and without making excuses. Remember those excuses that we went through? It's not my fault. I was in a bad place. You cannot make excuses for your wrong decisions that led to these guilty feelings. There are no excuses. You make things right with the person that you hurt. And you don't expect to get anything back from them. If they forgive you, great. If they need more time, that is between them and God. But you need to make things right with the person that you hurt.
I'm still making things right with people that I hurt. So because of Jesus, guilt doesn't have to be the boss of you. I'm going to invite the worship team up. This is a heavy topic. So you now have four minutes, four-ish minutes, to process through some things. Think about some things that you might want to share with your small group or with your leader. But take this next song to process everything, to think through it. Listen to what God's trying to say to you tonight. All right, let's pray. Jesus, because of you, guilt isn't the boss of us. Thank you for taking that away. Thank you for allowing us to live a life of forgiveness and redemption. I pray for each student and leader in this room that they know they can give it all to you. They don't have to keep anything from you. They don't have to feel guilty because you took that when you died on the cross for us. Thank you for everything. That was my word.
challenging phrase to sing yeah like if you actually mean that then my heart will sing no other name but the name of Jesus I don't know about you but I know I'm personally super challenged by that and sometimes feel like I can't sing it or mean it but also knowing that the grace of God covers me every single I hope you realize that, that the grace of God covers you every single day, no matter what you've done, no matter how bad you think you are, the things that you've done or committed, that Jesus still loves you (laughs) with a radical, crazy love of another kind. And how is that challenging us and, and, and allowing us to be transformed, that our guilt doesn't define us. I love that phrase. (laughs) That guilt doesn't define us. It can allow us to be reminded of our brokenness, but not define us. And so as we go into small groups, we get the chance to process more of that. Uh, Man, Lindsay, where are you at? Girl, thank you so much. Can we give it up for Lindsay? Come on now. Lindsay bringing the word to us tonight. and to super grateful for her and willingness to the boldness to speak, to speak vulnerably uh, to you tonight. Uh, so, for Lindsay. Hello. Lindsay, we love you. Hey guys, uh, man, please know this. You are loved and you are valued. And as we uh, enter into small groups, I hope that you can take that feeling, man, I'm loved and I'm valued here in this space and process well and vulnerably and honest together. Uh, and
And again, I hope that we'll see you uh, in two days, Friday night here at the church, 7 p.m. Would love to see you. Uh, seventh and ninth through ninth grade girls, you are dismissed off to your small groups. You can leave your chairs. Um, and gentlemen, seven, eight guys, can you please take their chairs? Take their chairs. And you are off to small groups as well. 10th through 12th grade girls, you can be dismissed, leave your chair there, and all the other guys take a lady chair and put it back.